Well, welcome again to another one of my podcasts, uh, Down to Earth, but Heavenly Minded. I'm going to let you in on a little secret uh, before we even start our lesson today, uh, our podcast, I should say. Uh, I do another podcast as well, Real Life Broadcasting, and uh, you can find it on the same channel that uh, you find my other ones on my audio file. Uh, if you do a search for Down to Earth but Heavenly Minded, or even do a search uh, for uh, Real Life uh, Broadcasting, and you'll find it. And uh, with that said, I just, uh, you know, start those, uh, those broadcasts off with uh, a little uh, music introduction, and I've been thinking about maybe adding it to uh, our podcast on Down to Earth, uh, Heavenly Minded. So I might put it in this podcast, and you let me know what you think. If you think it should be there or shouldn't be there, you can always leave a comment. Okay, with that said, I am going to move on to our uh, lesson today. And our lesson today is Lesson 13. And uh, we, we're done talking about money. We talked quite a bit uh, in uh, quite a few podcasts about money, but today we're going to be looking at something a little different. Uh, you know, in reality, uh, we love being simple. And how do I know this? Well, the Proverbs even tell me that. It says this, we love being simple. Wisdom is available, but we don't change because we love being simple. How long, uh, it says, how long, O oh simple ones, Will you love being simple? How long will you scoffers delight in their scoffing? And fools hate knowledge. If you turn at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit to you. I will make my words known to you. Proverbs 1, verses 22 and 23. So according to this, uh, we like wisdom. Uh, we like being simple and not become wise, we don't want to move out of our comfort zone. Wisdom uh, uh, accusations is not that we don't know enough or that we are un underprivileged or even that we are not gifted in wisdom. Rather, she asked directly, how long will you love being simple? We like immaturity, and we choose to ignore wisdom. We don't want to grow up. We refuse to take responsibilities. We prefer to stay put. We don't want to move out of our comfort zone. Note that the second and third line of Proverbs 122, she switches from talking uh, to the simple ones to talking about scoffers and fools. The simple one is not yet in the same class as a scoffer or a fool, but he will get there soon uh, if he doesn't do something. The key point here is that wisdom rebukes in the passage is not for those who have rejected her outright. She's not talking to uh, M nor, uh, you know, an immoral hedon. She's talking to religious people who hear her instructions regularly, but who haven't yet uh, assimilated it yet. She uh, talking to those who are young in their faith or immature in their thinking. She's speaking to those who, for one reason or another, love their current life, and don't really want to change. Well, in Proverbs 123, she backs, uh, she's back to addressing the simple ones. If you turn my reproof, if you turn at my reproof, our greatest need is to turn. We have to stop doing what we're doing, stop thinking, what we're thinking, and stop believing what we're believing. Maybe you talk uh, way too much, Proverbs ten nineteen. I kind of 
spit in that class. That's why I do podcasts, because I like to talk. You know it, and everyone else sure knows it. If someone tells a story, you have to tell one too. My brain is always going when, I, when somebody's talking, and I, I do this. I know I do. If there's an issue to discuss, you're compelled to make sure they understand you're on it. Well, when you start talking, people start, stop listening. Uh, let, me, let me just do that again. When you start talking, people stop listening. You know, I, I notice that with people, that if I'm kind of talking off the top of my head, perhaps you'll come to terms with it, even apologize for it. Maybe you'll give people freedom just to interrupt you if you're talking too much. But the problem here is not that people aren't honest enough with you. The problem is that you love yourself and you don't want to change. Uh, I'm afraid this describes me. And I really do. And I have to confess it. Well, maybe you're more of a quiet person. And I know people like this. Proverbs 18.1 You never answer a question in a classroom setting. If people ask you how you're doing, you graciously drop a safe, fine, or an occasional, risky, pretty good. If they want more details, they can ask. No one really knows you, but you're okay with that. If they don't know you, they can't hurt you, your feelings uh, the way others did in the past. You'll uh, accept the fact that you're just an introvert. It's how God made you. You're more of a behind-the-scenes person than up-front person. But wisdom rebukes, uh, lands right in the middle of your excuse. The, uh, the lands right in the middle of your excuse. Your life may change because you don't want to change. I'm sorry, your life not changing because you don't want your life to change. Okay, we love being simple. And there's a second part to this this, uh, this uh, topic, this subject. We just saw that we love being simple. Now, I'll tell you what this has looked like for me. Uh, this is another quote from Peter Kroll, by the way. I'm not very handy partly because I grew up in a family that never owned a home. Whatever something broke, we called the landlord. My wife, however, grew up in a nine-acre lot in a rural, Pens in rural Pennsylvania. They never saw an improvement they didn't like. So when we got married, Aaron, my wife, had to persuade me to become a homeowner. She uh, succeeded, and my life had lacked a comfort zone ever since. You see, I'm terrible. Uh, I'm terrified of the unknown. When we bought our first house, our first home, uh, fear gripped my heart so completely that when I went to unpack my office, I didn't even know what to do. I looked around at all the boxes and got so depressed and overwhelmed by the whole thing that I just laid down on the couch and did nothing. When Erin came downstairs from her own unpacking and saw me laying there, she didn't buy my excuse that I didn't know what I was doing. She pointed to the box and said, how about we start with this one? and began removing its contents. Well, the problem was not my uh, unbraining, uh, nor was it my personal preference. The problem was that I loved being simple. I had never owned or maintained a house. I didn't want to keep up with a house, and I didn't want to learn how to keep up a house and I didn't make these choices based on careful study of Scripture. 
uh, accompanied by spirit-driven meditation or prayer, I can add. It's not that I uh, constantly wanted to change. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I constantly believed renting a house would honor Christ more than owning a home. No, I simply didn't want to change. I didn't want to increase responsibility. Well, in the end, however, the Bible is not uh, primarily concerned with whether I buy or rent a house. The main thing God wants for me is to trust in Christ and not myself. Whoever believes in Jesus is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. John 3, verse 18, English Standard Version. Jesus promised to pour out his Spirit on all who believe in him. John 7, 37, 39 through 39. Do you believe? Will you trust Jesus? Well, the lies of easy immaturity. If you think it's easy, easier not to change than it is to change you are living a lie. You truly are. You're living a lie. Because I have called and you refuse to listen. I have stretched out my hands and no one has heeded. Because you have ignored all my counsel and would have none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when terror strikes you. When terror strikes you like a storm and your calamities come like a whirlwind. <clears throat> when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call upon me, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but will not find me. Proverbs 1, verses 24 through 28. Sometimes something has, given, has to give. When we love our simplicity, and do nothing about it. We are on a crash course with calamity. But who does that on purpose? When was the last time that you said to yourself, this thing I'm doing will destroy me and everything I treasure, so I think I'll keep doing it as long as possible? Calamity, terror, storms, whirlwind, distress, and anguish are not our friends. Well, so why do we keep doing foolish things? Why do we remain immature? Why do we, uh, why are we going to church, listening to sermons and uh, painting on a smile, but refusing to change? Why do we ignore counsel, yell at our kids, waste our time, and, uh, and live small lives, maintain distant relationships, and harbor bitter feelings and guilty pressure, pleasures. Have you ever led someone to Christ? Have you ever invited a co-worker to church with you? Have you led or have you learned how to lead a Bible study with your friends or your neighbors? Do you excuse more leadership uh, not than ever before in your lives? Are you any more honest, trustworthy, gracious, respectable, or influential than you used to be? Have you ever asked people close to you if they, uh, they've they seen uh, you grow in these areas? We remain simple because we hold on uh, to the deception that it is easier for us this way. We think our lives will be fun and carefree if we keep them small and mundane, ma uh, manageable. Uh, this is not true. Uh, the reality is that our lives will be more difficult, more complex, and more painful if we remain simple. If we refuse to hear wisdom and call for uh, repentance, wisdom will deny our call for help. Well, 
When an engine to your vehicle blows up, you wished you had learned how to maintain it over time. When your neighbors sue you for uh, encroaching on their property line, you wished you had cultivated a relationship better and fostered more open communication. When you face painful and chronic health issues in old age, you wished you had heeded the wisdom of exercise more and smoking and eating less. Let me make one qual uh, qualification. I'm not saying that bad things are always the result of our own sin or foolishness. Many passages in Scripture, such as Job and John 9, verses 1 through 3, deny such a uh, conclusion. I'm simply saying that choices have consequences, and we ought not to be deceived about this fact. Galatians 6, 7, and 1 Peter 4, 15. God often allows us to experience the consequences of our own decisions. It's merciful for him to do so, for it might jot, uh, jolt our, us out of our, depression, or our deception and motivate us to turn from it. But one of the uh, most de uh, distractive choices is to remain simple. Just do nothing and you'll ruin everything. Well, why do we do this? Why? Uh, why do we want to do this? Well, the reason for wanting to do this uh, uh, is the result of what we deserve. What do we do is the result of what we deserve and desire. Because they has um, because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of the Lord. Would have not my counsel and uh, despise all my reproofs? Therefore, they shall eat the fruit of their ways and have their fill of their own desires. Proverbs 1, verses 29 and 31. Well, to understand this section, we must understand why the Bible teaches us or what the Bible teaches us about desires. In practical, uh, what we do is a result of what we desire. 1 Peter 3, 3 states that those who scoff at the truth of God's word are simple, following their own sinful desires. Jesus says, the good person out of the good treasures of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil treasures of produces evil. Just like different kinds of trees, each produce their own kinds of fruit. Luke 6, verses 43 to 45. This, teach, this teaching means that we do certain things because we desire certain things. For example, someone yells in anger because he doesn't get the respect he wants from others. Someone else looks at pornography out of the desires for comfort, escape, control, or pleasure. Another person says fool, foolish and untrue things because she or he despises what people uh, like her or, or him. In all our actions, what we do is the result of what we desire. Now, when someone believes in Jesus, the Spirit of God takes up residence within him, giving him a good desire, Galatians 5, verses 16 through 26, providing a good explanation of the person's situation. God's Spirit intercepts his slavery to the old desire of the flesh, Galatians 5, 16. Those old desires won't give up easy, though. So a battle ensures over which desire will hold supremacy in the heart. Galatians 5.17 The presence of such inner turmoil is a sign that he is growing in grace, even if it feels to him like he's uh, a miserable failure. 
Thus he must be remaining constantly, reminded constantly that he is free from the penalty of God's law because Jesus died for him. Galatians 5.18. The more he gives in to the old desires, however, the more he will commit sinful actions. Galatians 5 verses 19 through 21. The more he trusts in Jesus, though he though his spirit is more, he will uh, demonstrate godly character and behavior. Galatians 5 verses 22 to 24. Over time, the spirit gains more and more ground over the flesh, and the old desires decrease in frequency and power. Galatians 5 verses 24 through 26. This process is what we normally call Christian growth or sanctification, and it's not easy. God is trying to set us apart from all this and conform us to his image, and that's really what it boils down to. Well, with that, I'm going to end my podcast, uh, and uh, we'll just another reminder about, uh, you know, God is out here, and you can find him in your Bible. Uh, All you have to do is open it. He's there. Well, have a great day, and I'm going to end it right here. And uh, Lord bless until we meet again. Bye for now.